And so tonight I want us to look at this very familiar verse in maybe a little different light. And to do that, I think we need to consider the context of the verse. You see, I, I, come to I came to understand a long time ago as I studied God's Word, if I want to understand the context of a verse, what does it really mean to us? If I can kind of get an idea of what it meant to those who heard it the first time it was ever preached, the first time it was ever read, if I can get an idea of what it meant to them, then I think I can get a little bit of an idea what it means for us today. And then that helps me to not take it out of context. And it's easy to do that. And we, I, 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 I mean, I preached some great sermons, but they were out of context. <laughs> you know, and that's all they were, were sermons. But it's just good when we can see the context. Thank you so much. You, you didn't drink out of it, did you? Thank you. You know, we, uh, <clears throat> we all have quirks. And don't look at me like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you got them too. <laughs> we all have quirks. My father, one of his, he won't drink after anybody. And he never drank after me, my brother, my sister. didn't drink after my mom. I got that quirk. I mean, why do we get those kind of things from our parents, you know? I don't drink. I, I, I never drank after my, my son, my daughter. I don't drink after my wife, Kathy. People say, you don't drink after your wife? I said, that's right. They said, do you kiss her? Now, wait a minute. Kissing and drinking is two different things. <laughs> Kissing is worth the risk. Amen. <laughs> I want you to consider with me tonight the context of Philippians 4.13. The writer, he's not in the best of circumstances. As a matter of fact, he's in prison. And it's not one of those Holiday Inn kind of prisons like we have today where the prisoners have more rights than we have. It was a dark, damp, rat-infested, roach-infested hole in the ground. It is not comfortable. It is not enjoyable. It is not pleasurable. And in those circumstances, he writes this letter to the Philippians. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Had I been Paul in those same circumstances writing this letter, I'm not sure I would have been nearly as joyful. I'm not sure I would have been nearly as encouraging. I mean, I'm thinking I might have just taken that as a good place to just complain a little bit. I mean, if anybody would have had a right to complain, it would have been Paul. I mean, wouldn't it have been easy for him sitting in that prison? And by the way, he's not going to leave that prison, at least alive. He's waiting for the appointed time when they will come and take him to the appointed place and they're going to separate his head from his body and his life here is going to be over. He's leaving, but he's not leaving alive. He's waiting to die. Wouldn't it have been easy for him to written to the Philippians and said, you know, I'd really like to encourage you, but I just don't feel real encouraging right now. As a matter of fact, I'm tired and weary and my body's sore and aches. And I've been beat up, and stoned and left for dead. I've been abused and taken advantage of. I've been shipwrecked at sea and floating around a shark bait out there in the sea for days. Boy, I wish I had something good to tell you, but it's just all bad. Wouldn't it have been easy for him to written that kind of a letter? I'm glad that's not the kind of letter he wrote, aren't you? <laughs> Matter of fact, the theme of Philippians, the theme is joy. He says, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. And out of those circumstances, he writes that great promise. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If you understand the context of this verse, I want you to keep your Bibles open. Turn back to chapter 3. Just keep your Bibles open. I'm going to go straight through the text. I want to show you tonight some things God has just kind of shown me here, some things that just have jumped out at me as I've studied this. You see, before I can get to the can-do of 413, I've got to come through some conditions. Because there, there's a lot of things you read before you get to chapter 4, verse 13. And, and I think there's a reason for that. It's because those things are important. 
And so let's just take a look at just a few things that, that I want to pull from, from the text here. Look, the first one you find in chapter 3, verse 3. It says, but we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You see what he's saying? <clears throat> Before I can ever get to that, I can do all things. I've got to understand that I've got to have had a circumcision take place. Now, we're not talking about a physical circumcision. Now, Paul did have to address that. Some of the Judaizers, when they came to Christ, they thought they still had to hold to the, the actual physical law and the law of circumcision. Paul had to correct that from time to time. But understand, when I got saved, there was a circumcision that took place. It just wasn't that kind. It was on the inside. And listen, some things got cut out. You hear me? Listen, he cut out my old sinful heart, and he gave me a brand new heart. I experienced a circumcision that was inward, that was spiritual. He said, this is not a fleshly thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's something that happened on the inside. You know what I've learned? I've learned that you can clean up a person on the outside and them look right and sound right and still not be right on the inside. But let me tell you what else I've learned. Man gets right, woman gets right on the inside. It's going to affect the outside. The outside will take care of itself when the inside is right. See, Paul's saying, listen, that, this can do all, that's a great thing, but it's not a promise for everybody. It's not a promise for those that do not know Jesus as their Lord. And so, I hear people unsafe quoting and claiming this verse. It's not a verse for the world. It's a verse for those who've experienced that spiritual circumcision. Those have been changed from the inside out. I can't explain it all. All I can tell you is I'm different than I used to be. All I can tell you, I'll never be the same again since that night when I came to him. Oh, something happened to me on the inside. Now, everybody around me couldn't see what happened on the inside. But notice, notice the second thing. Chapter 3 and verse 7. Before I can get to I can do all things, 413, I've got to understand it. This is for the people who've experienced that circumcision, that spiritual, that inward circumcision. And then in verse 7 he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So you see, you've got to understand, when, when you serve Jesus, when, when you come to Christ and you live for him, <clears throat> there are going to be some things you may have to count as loss. There may be some things you've got to turn loose of and let go of to follow Christ. And he says, I did this, and he didn't do it begrudgingly. He did it so I might follow. I said, I might know more about him, where I might become more like him, to grow in the grace and knowledge and the excellency of Jesus Christ. He said, some things I let, listen, Paul had everything he wanted in his day as far as possession. Listen, many believe he was a, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, was the highest, the elite of the religious society of Jesus' day. He had all the possessions he desired. But oh, that day when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road and his life was changed forever, he's never going to be the same again. Now, everywhere he goes, he says he just wants to tell folks, one day I was on the Damascus Road and a light shone. Whew. He had to let go of some things. He, he lost. You think of what he, he lost his power. He lost his prestige. He lost his possessions. But he says, I, I'm not sorry about that. I don't miss them at all. <laughs> you know the thing about possessions? Not necessarily anything wrong with possessions per se. The thing about possessions, if we're not careful, instead of us possessing them, they will possess us. And it's hard to focus on Christ, and it's hard to follow Christ and be what we ought to be when we spend our time focusing on gaining possessions and then keeping up those possessions after we gain them. And, and the thing of it is this. Understand, to live for God, there may be some things you have to turn loose of. Some of it may be friends. My best friend in high school, his name's Tim Marson. He lived just down the street from me. Uh, we did everything together. He, uh, Jim, Tim was a, <clears throat> a genius. Uh, by, by IQ, was, was was classified as a genius. Uh, I think it was just, he just liked hanging out with the redneck, you know. We played guitars and sang together, and we traveled, take, make, did trips together. We, we worked together. We both worked for my mother. She managed a garment factory where they made men's dress pants, and 
<clears throat> we both worked for her, and we did everything together. Boy, we had planned when we graduated high school, <clears throat> he was going to go to the University of Alabama, get a degree in chemical engineering, go on and get a master's degree in that. I was going to go to the University of Alabama and work toward and get a, a, a graduate degree in biochemistry. I loved science. I loved math. I still do to this day. And we were going to make a lot of money. <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly the way it worked out. <clears throat> he grad we graduated from high school. He went to the University of Alabama. I got married. I actually went to basic training for the military to start with and then got married and uh, wound up instead of Going to school, become a biochemist, God called me to preach, and at 19 years of age, I started preaching the gospel. Now, when I started preaching the gospel, I, I, I went to talk with Tim, and you see, the things we did together, most of it were things we shouldn't have been doing. But it wasn't a problem to me then, because that's what I was doing too. But I went to him and tried to talk with him, and tried to witness to him. He told me that he was just too intellectually advanced to believe all that. And uh, he didn't have any desire for that kind of life. And so he said, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if I ever see you again. I lost the best friend I had. I'm talking about people. I'd gained the best friend I'd ever had. I didn't, I didn't lose him because I let go of him. He let go of me. See, there'll be some things you may, have to, you may lose to follow Christ. But can I tell you how good God is? All these years I've been preaching. Every time I've ever preached anywhere close, he's lived in California, he's lived in <clears throat> uh, Arkansas, and he, he's lived in um, Oregon and some places in the West, and, and every time I've ever been going to anywhere, I was anywhere close to him and going to be preaching to me, and I would always contact him and tell him I was coming. I know, would he want to get together? Want to have a, would he come hear me preach? Not one time in all those years. Not one time would he ever meet me to eat. Or never had come, never did come, never would even come to hear me preach for all those years. About two years ago, I was going to Rogers, Arkansas to preach. A little place, just right next to, what's the name of that place? Hogeye, Arkansas. Hogeye, yeah. They got a mall there, the world famous Hogeye Mall. If you don't believe it, it's right there on the sign, world famous. <coughs> and, uh, but I was preaching a little real Baptist church outside of Rogers, Arkansas, and I knew Tim was working he, he was a, a CEO for a big corporation there in Rogers, Arkansas. And so I, I contacted him on Facebook. I said, Tim, I, I know you've never come to hear me preach. And uh, you, you never, you know, but I said, I'm going to be there. And I, man, I'd love, I'd love to at least meet you and have lunch. And let's just talk. It's been a long, long time. I said, man, we, we were such close friends growing up. And he said, since back, he said, I'd be glad to have lunch with you. Okay. I'm thinking this is a trap. And so I get there, and we meet, and uh, I go to, going to California, they have in California a type of cut of meat that I can't, you can't find in many other places, it's called tri-tip, and uh, if you know what tri-tip is, they don't know about that in the South, I mean, I've asked butchers, they don't have a clue what tri-tip is, but I love it, and, and so does he, and, and so there was a little place there in Rogers, he said, you could get good tri-tip, because these people were from California, and they came here, came there, and made it, and, so we met for lunch, and, and, and so he, he and his wife, first wife, had divorced, and I knew he had married a, a girl that uh, we both grew up. He, matter of fact, he dated her some when we were in high school, and her husband had, had left her, and so they had gotten married, and, and that's about all I knew about him at that point. And, but, but he come, I said, well, I said, Tim, listen, I'm, I'm going to be at the church uh, tonight, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. I sure would like for you and Teresa to come. Would you, would you please come? He, he says, oh, we're already planning on coming. I'm thinking, what in, what in the world? They came Friday night, 35 years. He wouldn't come. Wouldn't even talk about it. And there they sat. They came Saturday night. They didn't come Sunday morning. They came Sunday night because 
they went to their church Sunday morning because him and Teresa had gotten right with the Lord. And they were in a large Southern Baptist church there in Rogers, Arkansas. And this CEO of a large corporation, no, no telling what the man makes. You know what his job at the church is? He gets there early and, and all the older folks pull up. He valet parks their car for them. Not long after that, we had our first big conference in Pat Branson, Missouri, just like the one we're going to have in Pigeon Forge coming up a, a week from tomorrow, a church realization thing. They, they were several hours from Branson, Missouri. He found out about it. He said, we, we're coming. I don't know if you met him when, while you were there uh, or not, uh, uh, Josh, but he and his wife, Teresa, they drove there. They came to the Monday night service, drove home. Got in late, got up early, both had to be at work. They drove back Tuesday night to be in the service where I preached and then had to go home like that night and be back up early the next day. He came up to me after I preached on that Tuesday night. He hugged my neck and he said, thank you. But you kept asking me. He said, because I could never get away from that. He said, you've become the man I want to be. I always looked up to him. I mean, he was the smart one, you know. He's the genius. He's the guy making all the money. He said, thank you. He said, don't you understand something? Sometimes you may lose some things that God may let you have back when you're serving him. I like that I can do all things part. But before I can get to that, I've got to understand it's for those who, who've experienced a circumcision, something that's happened on the inside, a spiritual change. It's for those that have counted some things lost that they might know the excellency of Christ. Look in verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Before I can start claiming I can do all things, I've got to make myself, I have got to be conformable to his death. Now, what does that mean? Well, you see, the world, that, thir that, that Thursday night when Kathy and I went to that altar and we got saved, I mean, it, something we changed forever on the inside. We were never going to be the same. Listen, we got a hold of something that night and we've never been the same since. But the world couldn't see what happened on the inside so God gives us a way to show the world what happened on the inside. It's called baptism. Now, baptism, you don't, you're not baptized to be saved. You're baptized because you are saved. It is the first step of obedience after salvation. What baptism is, it is show, us showing the world in an outward symbol what's happened to us on the inside. Well, you see, when I stepped into that baptistry, down into those waters of that baptistry, and when I, the preacher got a hold of me, when he laid me down, he put me under the water. Listen, I identified my, I'm telling the world, I have identified myself with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. I have taken my part with him. And then when that preacher raised me up out, I'm telling everybody, I'm letting the world know, I now have risen to new life in him, just like he rose the third day been made conformable to his death taking my part and let the world know that I died to self I died to sin I died to the flesh and I have risen to new life in him but there's more we, we still can't get to that can do part yet I, I promise you I'm headed that way Look at verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I can get to that, I can do all things, there has to be a circumcision that took place inside of me, changed. I may have to count some things lost to follow Christ. I made myself conformable to his death, identified with him, his death, burial, and resurrection. But then also, I have to understand my citizenship is in heaven. See, the word conversation here, <clears throat> every other time in the New Testament, 
you find the word, English word, conversation, it always translates and has to do with our daily walk, our conduct. There's only one place that's not true, and it's this verse right here. There's a different word here. This word simply means my citizenship is in heaven. Now, you think about that. You see, I hold dual citizenship. I'm a natural-born citizen of the United States of America. I am a reborn citizen of heaven. Now, I travel a lot. I learned a long time ago, people who talk about how glamorous it is to travel, don't travel. <clears throat> Not much glamorous about airports. I mean, about the only thing spiritual you're going to find there is what you take with you. Not much spiritual about hotel. Uh, listen, you know you're traveling too much when you wake up in the middle of the night and you know you're in a motel room somewhere. And you cannot remember. You have to get up and look at the phone book to remember where you are. <clears throat> You're traveling too much. I don't do a great deal of international travel. Most of mine is in the United States, or at least in North America. <clears throat> but I've done some international travels. And listen, when, when you go into other countries around this world from the United States, you do understand most of the rest of the world hates our guts. And when you go to their customs, listen, they're not even nice to you. I mean, they treat you like a criminal right off. I mean, listen, they go through everything you've got. They pat you down in places they don't need to be packed. They search and look in places they don't need to be looking and treat you like a, just a common criminal. But, oh, listen, when I come back, when I come home, when I set foot back on the soil of the United States, of America, oh, when I go to custom and I'm coming home, I can see a smiling face, and they'll say, Mr. Crow, welcome home. It's so good to have you home safe and sound. Listen, oh, I want to get out and kiss the ground. I know a lot of things going wrong in this country, but I'm telling you, it's still the greatest place on earth. A lot messed up, but nothing God can't fix. But you know it's not going to start in the White House. It's going to have to start in the church house. I mean, Christians start living like they ought to, like we ought to. Then it might make a difference then. It might make a difference. You see, my citizenship, I'm a citizen of the United States. But, oh, listen, one day, when I leave this place and I stand before him, I stand at the gates of that city, in that place I have preached about all these years, that place I've told others about all these years, that place that I've been helping people get prepared to go to for years. I stand in that place. I'm not going to have to go through customs. They're not going to have to pat me down. They already know what I got with me because I'm taking none of this stuff here with me leaving it all behind, and when I get there, I'm just, they, listen, they're going to see, see his names in the book. And they open the Lamb's Book of Life, and they'll say, oh, yes. One night, January the 5th, 1978, after running from God all his teenage life, he finally came to his right mind, and he ran to God. He got saved in that altar that night. Oh, then they'll say, you enter in. Enter in, now, good and faithful servant. Enter in, citizen. Welcome home. Before I can start talking about that, I can do stuff. We need to understand, hey, we got citizenship in heaven. But when this life is over, hey, it's going to get better. There's a better place than this that we can go. Well, I, I promise you I'm moving as fast as I can, but I, I just got to share a couple more things with you. Look in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. Now remember where he's at, prison. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Before I can get to that can do, I've got to understand, I've got to understand, got to understand mm. to learn how to be careful for nothing 
What that means, don't worry. I personally believe it is a sin for a Christian to worry and fret about the things God's already promised he'd take care of. When we worry and fret over things, do you understand what a statement that makes to this world? That we must not really believe what this God tells, says he'll do. I'm just simple enough to believe that if God says he sees the sparrow that falls to the ground and he adorns the lily and watches over it in the field, I'm just simple enough to believe if he cares that much about sparrows and flowers that he loves me and he knows how to take care of me. I've just got to trust him. Trust him when I don't understand what he's doing yet. Trust him when I don't know what the outcome's going to be. Trust him when it's good and when it's bad. Trust him when I feel like it and when I don't. Trust him when those around me are trusting him and trust him when those around me are not trusting him. I'm, I'm, my wife will tell you I've, I've never been much of a worrier. I, I just, the, let me tell you the thing about worrying. Number one, it doesn't help the situation at all. Actually makes it worse because it will affect your emotional state, your mental state, and your spiritual well-being to worry about. And by the way, I tell people, we have three ladies that work full-time in our office, and <clears throat> while us guys are out traveling all over the place, they do all the work and make us look good. But I tell people, I don't have to worry. I got enough, those ladies in the office, they worry enough for all of us, so I just let them take care of that part of it. I just believe before I can start claiming I can do all things through Christ, i got to trust him in everything else. If I don't trust him in those things, how can I claim I can do all things? Are you getting it yet? Are you understanding that there's a context here and there are some conditions here before we can start claiming that kind of a promise? There's one more I want you to see and then we're going to finish up with that verse 13. One more in chapter 4. Would you look down to verse 11? He said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, underline that word, learned. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You get it? Before I can claim that I can do all things, I got to know, I got to be a part of that spiritual circumcision. I, I've been changed on the inside. Listen, Jesus has changed me on the inside. I may have to count some things lost to follow Christ. I've been made conformable unto his death. And I've shown the world in an outward, symbolic way in baptism that I, can, I, I associate myself I, 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 with his death, burial, resurrection. I'm a citizen of heaven. And I've got to learn to be careful for nothing. Quit worrying about what God's already said he'd take care of and go and live for him. But then he says somehow, some way, you have to learn how to be content. I'm telling you, I have never in my life met as many discontented people as I have in the last five years. We're living in an age of discontentment. It's in our society, it's in politics and government. I mean, <clears throat> we are discontent. And the sad thing is, it has come into our churches. I meet people in churches week after week after week. They're not happy with anything in their life. They are discontented. They're discontented with their husband or their wife or their parents or their children <clears throat> or they're discontented with their church or, or, or their pastor or their Sunday school teachers or their deacons. They're discontented with their jobs and their careers. They're discontented with school. They're, they're not content with anything in life, it seems. And it is permeating our churches. Paul says, if you want that, I can do all things. Learn how to be content with what he's already done. Learn how to be content where he's already put you, what he's already given you, how he's already blessed you. If you can't be content with what he's already done, don't you start claiming a lot of other things. Learn how to be content. 
preached a revival in California some years ago. And Wednesday night, I'm still out in the vestibule, just about, just about everybody's gone. There's a young man that's kind of been hanging around, and I'd met him Sunday. He was a young preacher boy. He's about 19, 20 years old. He was there every service. So he's standing around there, and everybody's about, he comes, he said, Brother Crow, can, can I ask you something? I said, sure. He said, I just, I got one question. I said, what is it? He says, uh, how can I get a job like you got? I said, what do you mean? He said, how can I get a job like you've got? I said, well, what kind of job do you think I have? He said, you've got the greatest job in the world. I said, really, why do you say that? He says, listen, you get to travel. You get to travel all over the place. And, and oh, and, and again, it's not glamorous. I assure you. He said, you get to go to all these places. He said, you get to eat in all these nice restaurants. And I'm thinking, yeah, and that's killing me one spoonful at a time. <clears throat> and he says, you get to do preach and, and, and be in all these certain and, and help and encourage so many people, see people say. He said, and you get paid for it. You got the greatest job in the world. He said, how can I get a job like you've got? I said, you really don't know. He said, yes. I said, go get a pad of paper and a pen and a pencil and you come back. He runs, he gets a pad of paper, a pen, he comes. I said, sit down right there. He sits down, so I write this down. I said, go to Winfield, Alabama. That's W-I-N-F-I-E-L-D. He looks at me, I said, write it down. I believe there's, isn't there a Winfield, Kansas? Have a big bluegrass deal goes on there every year. Yeah. <clears throat> this is not Winfield, Kansas. I said, write down. Go to Winfield, <clears throat> Alabama. <clears throat> now write this down. Find the main traffic light. I said, it won't be difficult. There's not that many. When you find the main traffic light in Winfield, Alabama, I want you to go north one mile. And north one mile from that main traffic light, there'll be a nursing home on the right side of the road. I want you to pull into that nursing home and park. He's looking at me. He stops and write it down. I said, I want you to go inside, ask to speak to the program director. And when you speak to the program director, you tell him this. So I'd love to start coming here on Sunday mornings. I'll come every Sunday morning. We want to have a, a, a church service here for the folks in the nurse, all the ones that can come and want to come, and we want to provide a service for them. And so when can we do this? So when, when you get that schedule and they set that up and they give you a time, I said, then what you do, then you every Sunday, you go and you have that service and you preach to those folks in that nursing home. He's riding, riding. He finally gets caught up and he looks at me. He said, what else? I said, I don't know. He said, looks at that, he says, how's this going to help me get a job like you've got? I said, I don't know that it will, but all I know to tell you is this, that's the first place God gave me to serve. I said, when I answered a call to preach <clears throat> on Thursday night, my pastor sent me to the nursing home the next week and said to set up a service. They weren't having one on Sundays. So Kathy and I went, and we set up a time, and I said, young man, every Sunday morning, we went to the nursing home. And every Sunday morning, we'd play the piano, the guitar, we'd sing with those folks. And they'd come, sometimes 50, 60 people would come, and <clears throat> some of them could walk in with walkers and canes, and some of them had to come in in wheelchairs, or even some of them, they rolled them in on beds. I said, but we came. We went every Sunday. We went. We played and sang. I, I opened the Bible, and I preached God's Word Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I said, young man, many times half of that crowd or more would be asleep for the whole thing. And I said, the ones that were awake, you weren't sure if they were with you or not. I said, but it probably prepared me to preach in Free Will Baptist Church is about as good as any preaching I could have done. Because it helped me, helped me to understand, you preach whether anybody amens you or not. You preach whether anybody's awake or not. You preach whether anybody responds or not. You preach because God said, preach the word. I said, young man, what I'm trying to tell you is this. That's the first place God gave me and Kathy. God trusted us. He trusted us. To go in those dear precious folks, many of them that had been in church all their life till they got in the nursing home and now could no longer physically attend church. But to give them an opportunity to still feel like they could come to church. I said, when God saw he could trust us with that, guess what he did? 
he gave us some more to do. And when he saw he could trust us with that, I said, son, he let me pastor one of his churches. I said, can you believe it? God let me pastor one of his churches. I couldn't believe it. My first church, Joelton, Tennessee, my senior year of college, I drove out there. They had 15, when we started going, they had 15 people, 15 for Sunday school, 15 Sunday morning, 15 Sunday night, 15 Wednesday night. Oh, they were a faithful crowd. I pastored there my whole senior year. We were there a year. At the end of that year, listen, we had about 125 every Sunday coming to church. You see, when God saw he could trust us with 15, he gave us some more. I said, young man, everywhere God's ever put us, we've been content where he placed us. And we were as faithful as we knew how to be in that place. And we ministered there like that's where we'd be the rest of our lives. And when God saw he could trust us with those things, he kept opening other doors until I do what I do today. I said, young man, what's God got you doing right now? He looked at me and he told me a couple of things. I said, then this is what I'm trying to tell you. You be as faithful as you know how to what God's already given you. And when he sees he can trust you with that, he'll give you something else to do. He'll open some other doors. And then when you get to be my age, I hope and pray that God will take you a whole lot farther than I'll ever be able to go in my ministry. We just got to be faithful right now. We don't wait to get faithful. We start right now. We don't wait till God gives us something else. We, we be faithful now. Now, I want you to consider this, and I'm done. Yeah, I know this is a different, little different kind of sermon than I typically preach, but uh, <clears throat> God's just been <clears throat> kind of branding this thing in my heart. And then we finally come to that verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I want to ask you a question. As Paul was writing that verse down, as it was given to him by the Holy Spirit of God, do you believe that Paul believed what he wrote? You think he believed it? Now, remember, as he's writing this, he's waiting for them to come take him away and execute him. Do, do you think he believed that promise? Do you think he believed God could deliver him from that prison? I do too. Matter of fact, he'd done that one time before, at least we know, among the Philippians. Remember, they get him, Silas get put in jail, and at midnight they're singing and praising God, and, and God just shook the foundation of that prison. The Bible says their chains fell off, and, and, and God freed them. God can. He, he knew he'd seen God do it before. He, he knew God could. But I also believe that even though he believed God could, that even if he didn't, he still believed. Those three Hebrew children, as they stood there and they said, we're going to throw you into that furnace of fire if you don't bow. They said, well, our God can deliver us, but if not, doesn't change one thing. We still believe it. Now picture Paul as the time comes. They come to him and they take him out of his cell. They unchain him. And they're walking him to the place of execution. As he's walking there with them to this place where his life's soon going to be over here. They take him. They lay his head on a block. The executioner stands with the axe raised above his head. As the axe is falling, I can almost hear, I can almost see the lips of Paul moving. And I can almost hear him say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can I tell you what this is a promise for? 
It's not a catch-all, cure-all, claim-all, cover-all kind of verse. I can have money. I can have possessions. I can have that promotion because I can do all things. That's how it's usually quoted. That's not what it is. For Paul who wrote it, I believe it meant that whatever he was going to face, whatever happened to him in that prison, whether he lived or died, whether God set him free or not, he could do all, God would give him all the things he needed to face what he's got to face. He left this life believing I can do all things through Christ. That's the promise he gives to you tonight. Oh, if you know him as your personal Lord and Savior. Oh, today, I'm telling you, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you're in the midst of right now. I don't know what you're going to walk back into when you walk out of church tonight. But I came to tell you, God has promised us if we know him, he'll give us all the things we need to face and go through what we're going through right now. He may deliver us out of it. He may deliver us through it. And he may deliver us by taking us out of here and giving us something a whole lot better. But I came tonight to tell you, I believe that verse. I can do all things. Through Christ which strengthens me. Would you bow with me for prayer?